Oh, welcome inside our San Francisco studios. I feel like we've been waiting a few weeks, maybe even months, for today. The first college football playoff rankings officially have been revealed. Mike Am and Yogi Roth with you. And from a Pac-12 perspective, actually not all that bad. I remember a couple weeks ago, maybe five, six weeks ago, national media, Pac-12's done. Oregon's done after week number one. After Utah's lost to USC, they're done. I look right now and see an Oregon team checking in at number seven and a Utah team uh, at number eight. Not done, the Conference of Champs. Anything that stands out to you in terms of these rankings, Yogi? I think right now, I, I feel good. You know, you look at it, one loss teams, where they're ranked, the Georgia thing will take care of itself. You know, eventually we'll get into the conversation of comparing one loss teams versus one loss teams. But for today, you should feel good being ahead of Oklahoma, ahead of Florida. Like we've seen worlds where two lost teams from the SEC are ahead of one lost teams in the Pac-12, et cetera. So I, I, I feel fine. Like I think the teams are being respected. Uh, I don't feel as though they're getting slapped around by the committee like we felt in the years past. So overall right now for these two teams, they're, they're in a prime position heading into the last few weeks of the season. All right, and if you're looking at those rankings right now, keep in mind, one through four, those teams, they're playing each other. Two SEC squads, two big 10 teams that are there. Clemson, mild surprise that they're not in that top four, but the reality is because those other teams are going to be playing each other, you would imagine that Dabo squad just slides into one of those spots and then all of a sudden you get into this conversation about a Georgia squad, uh, Oregon, Utah, a one-loss Pac-12 champion. How do they fit into that conversation? Yeah, well, I, when I saw the Clemson thing, we both did the mock committee. Yeah. And basically what you do is you go and you sit on the committee and they show you what the criteria are and how they evaluate all the teams that are considering the opportunity to play in the college football playoff. And of course, conference champion is one of them. You can kind of go down the list and see what they are, what matters when they go into it. I thought of 2014 when I saw where Clemson was sure. ranked. So here we go. Championship one, you got to win your conference championship. You'd like to think strength of schedule, head to head competition, comparative outcomes of common opponents. Auburn would be the one in this game when we're talking about Pac-12 teams based on the SEC schedule and of course, Oregon playing Auburn. But to the point of Clemson, you go back to that year, Florida State came off a national title. They were undefeated. They were undefeated again. They made it to the CFP and got smoked by the Oregon Ducks. So I wonder if the committee is thinking about that history of saying, well, they didn't play anybody. They haven't looked as well as they looked at least a year ago on tape. So we'll slide down Clemson to the fifth slot versus being one or two based on being a repeat champion. A close win against North Carolina that I don't think a lot of people had anticipated in that conference. What's interesting about the criteria there, every committee member, sure, they're looking and they're considering those factors, but each individual member on that committee, they can put as much value as they want on one particular thing. You mentioned conference champ, like that might not be all that important for someone that's sitting in one of those spots, and that becomes a little bit of a factor. Yeah, I think that's going to be the fun part as the drama heats up, right? Yeah. We're going to learn a ton next week. LSU, Bama play each other. Where's the loser going to be? Are they going to be behind Oregon and Utah, who don't play this week. And that, that's, to me, when the dominoes start to fall. Then, of course, you have Ohio State, Penn State. Then at the end of the year, Auburn, Alabama. There's other critical games that matter. Because overall, I think when we look at Utah and Oregon, Mike, they're going to win. Yeah. Now, the challenge is the committee will say style points don't matter. What history has said is that style points do matter. So I think for now, if you are a Duck fan, if you are the Utes, a fan of that program, you want your team to go dominate. You have to continue to dominate on both sides of the ball, like they have in games. And then we start to craft the arguments around the truth, like Oregon playing three consecutive games that are big time. When you look at who Alabama has played, you look at really anybody other than LSU, nobody's had consecutive games that are dramatically challenging. Sure. It just doesn't happen. That's not how it's scheduled out, whether you're in the ACC and, of course, obviously the SEC or even in the Big Ten. All right, so the biggest question, at least from a Pac-12 perspective, you have two teams right now that are sitting with one loss that are definitely in striking distance in Oregon and Utah. If both of those teams run the table, we got a Pac-12 championship game at Levi Stadium. It's going to be the most significant one that, that certainly that we can think of. A one-loss Pac-12-1 Pac-12 team. And let's just say, for argument's sake right now, it's Oregon. It doesn't happen that often where you can run the table in this conference. Nine conference games, that's another factor, too, as the committee is looking at, at different criteria. It, do we live in a world where a one-loss Pac-12 team like Oregon and even Utah is on the outside looking in? Well, that's going to be the narrative, right? That's what Paul Feinbaum's going to say. That's what a lot of people around the country are going to say. And to me, when I hear that, I say you're not watching. You're just not watching. You're not, you don't see the depth 
of competitiveness within the conference. It's fair to say that the SEC at the top, perceptually, is one of the best conferences in the country. The NFL would say that too when they draft guys. But this year is the bubble we are in. That is the reality. And the reality is, when you look at the conference games that Alabama has played as of yet, let's just run through their opponents. South Carolina, sure. they're four and five. Ole Miss is three and six. Tennessee is four and five. Arkansas, who they most recently beat, is two and seven. Point is they haven't beaten anybody. They haven't proven it. So when you look at the body of work of their schedules, you're going to say, all right, an LSU team that they played and had a bye week prior to, sure. they should play great in this ballgame. We're going to say the same thing when they play Western Carolina, which is basically a bye week prior to the Auburn game. Yeah. So I just think and I hope and I trust, based on at least the first rankings we've seen, that the committee is going to take that and things like that into consideration. All right, for and you're mentioning that bye, so I'm thinking about a, a matchup between Alabama and LSU. If you're a Pac-12 fan, Oregon or, or Utah, you're sitting there rooting hard for LSU. And I would also argue you want Tua to be able to play in that game. Yeah, you do. I mean, here's, here's where, we're running, where we'll get loud as the year goes on. Let's just say LSU wins, and let's say Tua is 75%. The biggest argument from Nick Saban's mouth in that program and that part of the country is going to be, you know you we're one of the best four teams in the country. Look at our roster. Look at our historicals. We didn't have our best player playing. Fair argument. All they might be right. And with a month to prepare, they could probably compete against anybody. But that's not the world we live in. That's not what the first ranking showed us about Clemson. So what is my point? If we're going to say that for Bama, you have to say that about Oregon. Re receiving court, completely different. Tight ends. On the bench, they're not playing. They're injured. Jawan Johnson, Micah Pittman, they both missed four, four and a half games for this team. They're now playing. So if you're going to play that card, which you can, it's part of the rules that the committee is given in their pack when they say this is how we decide who gets that berth. you got to play it for everybody. And that is, to me, not even me getting loud yet. Like that's, Wait another week or two and we'll do that. That's just saying these, these are the facts. These are the facts. You could be sitting in the SEC network right now. You could be sitting in Clemson right now. You could be sitting in Texas right now. You could be in Oklahoma right now. Those are the facts. Yeah. And that's, to me, what the world in which we have to play in today. Eye test, you're going to hear that term a lot over the next few weeks. Passing and checking the boxes. I, I look at Utah and I think to myself, uh, a quarterback is efficient as any, and I mean that in the most positive way. I feel like you term you throw the term efficiency out there for a quarterback, and it almost sounds like game manager and demeaning. That's not what we're talking about with Tyler Huntley, and legitimately one of the best defenses in the country. Yeah, and it's not even close. I mean, Tyler Huntley, he's completing 81 of percent of his passes yeah. in the second half. He's 77 percent on third down. It's not as though he's playing catch. Like a lot of teams do around the country. A lot of them that are ranked in the top 10, in my opinion, do that offensively. He's not. He's been asked to do different things. He's not just throwing bubble screens and letting all-American wide receivers run free. He's having to operate this system. And this is not a Utah team that is one with fierce guys in the front seven. I mean, they got a first-round yeah. corner in Jalen Johnson. They have a guy who will play for a while in Julian Blackman in the back end. Their front seven, I think, would compete against every one of those teams ranked higher than them right now. So hopefully they get that opportunity, not just in a Rose Bowl, if they do end up winning this conference. So I do think when you look at the committee, it's important to note, Rob Mullins, recused. He can't talk about the Oregon Ducks when he's in there. So you count on guys like Ronnie Lott, who comes from this conference, who's on the committee, people to do their job to not just shape lazy narratives. And that, to me, is going to be the most impressive thing that I think I'd take away from this. The committee didn't sit back in September and October and just say, hey, we'll wait and we'll look at the rankings and say, yeah, Clemson keeps winning and put them in the top four. I think they did their job. Yeah. This is the first time in week one where I'm like, yeah, hey, props, knuckles, like nice work. It makes, it makes some sense. By the way, the conversation between the two of us about this topic, it's not oh, no, done. We're warm enough. Yeah. And it's like not even close. We're going to be doing this every single week, every Tuesday. You don't want to miss the show. Inside Pac-12 football on Pac-12 Network. Uh, good job, because I guess we're yeah, yeah. doing the whole knuckle, the knuckle deal. Yeah. We'll see you on Tuesdays on Pac-12 Network.